Welcome all to the Dynamic Coalition webinar on sustainability models of OER. Thank you all for being here. I'm giving the floor to my colleague Aishatu for a very brief presentation of the uh, OER recommendation, and then we will continue with our distinguished speakers. Please, Aishatu, the floor is for you. Thank you, Eleni, for giving me the floor. Uh, I will make a short uh, presentation about the OER, UNESCO OER recommendation. My, I will do my presentation in French. So I shall briefly go over UNESCO's recommendation on OER, but let us first see what a recommendation is. A recommendation is one of the main standard setting uh, instruments of UNESCO. It is the instrument through which UNESCO is going to uh, uh, indicate a set of uh, standards to uh, member states and then those uh, member states uh, are to report uh, periodically on the principles and standards in the recommendation and the recommendation this one in particular it will be relatively flexible and will be able to adapt to constant technological uh, progress unesco does not have hundreds of recommendations. There are dozens of uh, UNESCO recommendations. Just to give you an idea, from 1956 to today, the organization has uh, adopted only 35 recommendations. And uh, since uh, the uh, year 2000, there have been seven. So let's uh, look at things uh, more closely uh, regarding OER. A recommendation was adopted in 2019, giving definitions uh, of OER and definitions of open licenses. Since open licenses are contained in the definition of OER, so uh, these uh, OERs are uh, materials for uh, learning, teaching, research uh, uh, in the public domain or protected by um, copyright and publish under open license authorizing consultation, reuse and uh, repurpose uh, and adaptation and redistribution free of charge for others. Uh, an open license is a license which respects uh, uh, intellectual property rights of the holder, but uh, also gives the public the right to consult, reuse or repurpose the material and to adapt educational material. The recommendation also gives a list of um, stakeholders and it also clearly defines objectives. So the objectives, uh, there are five of these. First of all, uh, the uh, capacity building for the creation, access, use, adaptation, and redistribution of OER. The second objective is uh, to develop support policies. And then the third is to uh, guarantee inclusive and equitable access. And the fourth, which will be of particular interest today, is uh, to develop uh, sustainability models. There's a fifth objective regarding facilitation of international cooperation. In 2020, there was the dynamic coalition which was set up in order to support the implementation of the UNESCO recommendation and also uh, to enhance the uh, uh, sharing and, and to create synergies around the recommendation. So uh, the areas of action of the recommendation, uh, that is what you see on this next slide. So if you look at number four, which is in a way central to this webinar, let us focus on this. So this uh, is quite close to the four, five objectives I was uh, mentioning earlier. And here you have number four, to develop sustainability models. So key messages were uh, drafted, which are measures and actions to be taken by member states 
uh, or which can serve as inspiration for them. Regarding uh, foster sustainability models for OER, uh, here we have uh, revised uh, policies and regulations in uh, terms of uh, procurement, uh, uh, widening simplification of uh, the procurement of uh, goods and services, uh, creation of property, translation, adaptation, preservation, archiving, etc. And then uh, we have uh, the strengthening and capacity building. And then uh, the catalyst for sustainability models uh, through uh, financing, uh, traditional financing and non-traditional mechanisms to mobilize resources for the acquisition of OER. It also uh, refers to the promotion and where raise, raising of institutions in co countries of other uh, models of creation of uh, added a value through OER stressing participation, also a call for innovation and uh, common causes, also support uh, to uh, linguistic translation of open licenses and the creation of mechanisms for the implementation and the use of OER and optimization of budgets and existing funds. So uh, this covers a lot, there are quite a few actions and measures which have to be implemented by the member states. But we only have an hour, so we won't be able to go into every detail, but uh, through the uh, presentations that are going to be given, we will be focusing on uh, uh, the most important points in order to uh, give some idea of the sustainability mechanisms, funding, and also uh, the sustainability models for OER in higher education. So now I should like to turn to our distinguished panelists. So we shall give the floor to our first speaker, Mr. Amil. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation to my colleagues at UNESCO and for spearheading this important initiative in the, in the Dynamic Coalition and trying to get us moving forward with the very valuable goals of the UNESCO recommendation from 2019. Uh, I have a, a short presentation, about 10 minutes, to get the uh, the, the ground uh, set the ground and the discussion a bit on on economic models and, and sustainability factors for OER. I uh, basically uh, divided this into two, I think, which are two fairly common ways uh, of of setting up this discussion around sustainability when we're talking particularly about economic models for for OER. The first one is a commercial, and if we could move to that slide, please, it is a commercial aspect of uh, OER. And uh, what I tried to do is to use, I think we have, we've had uh, a, a few uh, publications that have dealt specifically with, with uh, the idea of looking at these, these factors that, uh, uh, these um, possibilities of engaging in sustainable economic models for OER over, over the years. And I think we've had some convergence uh, over time into uh, what kind of commercial models have been tried, experimented with, and which ones have been successful uh, in, in maintaining a lot of, uh, a lot of initiatives. And I'll, I'll go very quickly through these, and I've uh, in indicated a, a number of examples on the right, and these slides will be available later for those that want, uh, that can't find uh, these, uh, these initiatives just by searching. But I just wanted to give you a, a sense of, of some of the initiatives that actually exist that have been using these models. And so, if you look at uh, the, the creator pay mo creator pays model, which is the idea that whoever is furnishing the uh, either the book or the uh, the music or whatever it may be will pay to make this uh, this uh, this resource available. You can look at uh, a music example from ja Jamendo, which is a, a music platform that's been fairly successful, where um, the creator pays to have their content there or a, a, a portion of their their profits to the platform to have them available. But you can look, and I just chose two uh, uh, initiatives 
uh, you can look at uh, publishers, book publishers that have been doing this very successfully for a very long time. These are two small publishers from Brazil, Filos and Pimenta, but I just wanted to give you a, a sense, you know, African Minds is another one that comes to mind. There are a bunch of other initiatives that have been working like this for a very long time. And in this in this model, the creator will pay whatever fee is uh, is is necessary to make the product become available, and it can be available with an open license. Um, there's a very strong model around commercial use, and I think one of the most uh, successful ones that I that I think people don't really quite know about is filmmusic.io. Uh, a lot of their resources are available as YouTube tracks, and uh, the way filmmusic.io works is that they uh, license their tracks, which are really great quality, um, license them openly with a CC BY license, but if you're going to make commercial use of them or if you want to donate, you can do so. Uh, and it's been very sustainable. Uh, you can pay for extra features, and I, I just decided to use an example of a software here, but it's a software that we use in education quite a bit. Uh, the new productivity software like Holy Office, which is a substitute for um, or an improvement to other initiatives like um, uh, like the office suits that you, you might be regularly using. And um, you, depending on whether you pay for, for, uh, for a, a monthly fee or an installment or a user uh, a per head, you know, per user, you will get extra features. And so the base of the software is open. It has some limitations. If you pay, you get a little bit more. But this, the base of the software, the code itself is free. The, you know, the, the, the system itself is free and open. Um, you can get uh, commercial models that are based in customization. This is a, a, a model that's incredibly successfully used in, in free and, and open software. Uh, and it happens in, uh, in editorial uh, in publications as well. So you might get a, a base uh, text or book or a course and uh, you can uh, have uh, people pay for customization. So whether it's uh, just to put the logo of an institution or a school or a university, but they might pay also to have certain features that they need or plugins that must be installed or content that needs to be translated. And that's a very successful model that's been around for a very long time. You can also pay for extra services and that has been a consolidated as a model for OER, uh, a big OER uh, uh, platform. So uh, Lumen and Coursera are good examples of this where a lot of content in the case of Lumen, I believe all content, but Coursera some content is available openly and you can pay either for you know, data analytics or you can pay for certification. And that, that model has been uh, also around for quite a long time. Finally, uh, advertising is one there is uh, there's uh, a lot of, uh, I think, uh, uh, people are put, a, put off by the idea of advertising and educational content as they should be. And so I, I don't have a very good example, but I decided to stretch it a little bit and look at what Open Spotify does because Spotify is a platform for content. And if you look at podcasts that are streamed through Spotify, a lot of them, or a few of them, have open licenses. And so, uh, you know, Open Spotify supports itself in, in through through impartially through uh, through advertising, you could qualify that some of these some of this content that's available openly elsewhere is distributed through through Open Spotify uh, with an open license and is generating revenue through advertising. It is a model that I think uh, in our next talk we're gonna we're gonna talk uh, we're gonna have some some ideas of this, but I think it's a model that, that people are generally not uh, uh, fond of for good reasons. Uh, finally, direct sale is is a, a model that. Uh, Many publishers started uh, working in the beginning and it was unsuccessful for many of them. But uh, I decided to pick one example of, of, uh, of a, a, an author who's Olga de Dios. She's from Spain and she has uh, an incredible uh, manifesto around publishing openly and she publishes her books, which are incredibly high quality and are available all over the world and have been translated in many places. The books are available with an open license and you pay for the print version, which um, is a model that has shown to be unsuccessful to many large publishers, but sustains itself uh, through small publications. This is just one example, there are, there are many others. So this, this is just a, just a general overview of what in the generally commercial space has been done to provide some financial sustainability for these, uh, for these services. If we can move on, we can just move two slides over. Uh, we'll talk a bit about what I'm calling here reciprocity models. And uh, reciprocity models are a bit different. And that's a generic word for a lot of the things that are going to be here. But, but we find a lot of other ways to sustain uh, repositories which are not 
necessarily uh, based on on advertising or commercial use and and one of them is obviously subscription i mean uh, paying a, a monthly fee for something so uh, you know flat world knowledge moved in that direction from a, a previous model if you looked at uh, le monde and le monde diplomatique here in brazil and in other places you you have a newspaper that's licensed openly but you pay for it uh, through subscription you it through subscription and the user base, the, you know, the large user base sustains the, the publication, uh, but uh, it's available to everyone. So uh, there's, a, there's a model here where, where there's, it's not necessarily getting the, um, the largest amount of, of people to, to subscribe or to pay uh, and only they get the benefit, but the sustainable base of continuous subscription uh, of, of paying users that will allow the, the, the publication or the content to be available to other people. Uh, there's obviously the donation model and you can look at a, a number of successful uh, uh, platforms that have sustained themselves through large donations, both uh, from foundations and, and government, but also small donations. They're, they're open to get small donations and open stacks and uh, is a, a good example. And FET, which has, uh, I call it FET, I don't know if it's, it's in English, it's P. E H E T, but uh, we uh, it has a, a very long uh, track record of providing quality content openly uh, for physics, math, and so forth uh, uh, online. A uh, crowdfunding has has been a really great example for for small publications and, and educational material as well. You know, for production of videos of educational content, documentaries. Uh, uh, Catarse is a platform for for crowdfunding here in Brazil, but there are many others around the world. Every country has a bunch of them that are allowed for crowdfunding. We've had very successful examples of people willing to fund educational content, children's books, platforms, uh, documentaries through crowdfunding. And it's a, it's a, uh, when, when you find, find a niche, it's very easy to keep it going. Another one is crowdsourcing is this idea more aligned with, with uh, free and open software where you get people to contribute. So again, I use only Office as an example, but it could really apply to almost any free and open source uh, initiative. Uh, is this idea that you get people to contribute and be, participate in, in the process of creating content and joining in. And there are other examples in the OER lands, uh, landscape as well. Finally, uh, one that we, we don't really talk about much because it seems self-sustainable, but it isn't, is public funding. Uh, you know, we have uh, uh, we've done surveys from countries in, in South America and Latin America, and we know that uh, public initiatives die very often. I mean, they don't sustain themselves very often, but it's, it's a, uh, when they do uh, last, it's, it's a very viable funding method for large, very large nationwide or regional repositories. And so... Uh, we've had some successful initiatives around the world in keeping the public repositories open and available. They mutate and they change. But public funding continues to be, at least in our region of the world, a major source of, of uh, availability of content and repositories. Finally, partnerships, establishing partnerships with existing uh, 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 players and creating a consortium is a really good way to do this. So the archive.org does this with uh, you know, libraries and people that have content that they want to share online. Europeana is a great consortium example. And finally, working through recognition. It doesn't seem like it's an economic model, but uh, putting your content for online in some examples, can, you can look at it as working through uh, to get you know, a public display or participation in a community or to just get recognition for the work that you do. Uh, these are important, I think they're important ways to look at the more economic side of this. And just very quickly to finish, I'd just like to just bring uh, on the next slide some other considerations that we've been, uh, we've been unearthing here doing some literature reviews on sustainability, trying to get a sense of what other factors are involved beyond the idea of just financial sustainability. And if we can move to the next slide, I'd appreciate it. So we know that you know financing and whatever in, uh, arrangement we come up with is incredibly important to keep, uh, particularly repositories open, but even the creation and the sharing of OER. But there, there are a number of other factors that are that I just wanted to share with you for us to, to think together. Is is this idea that you know particularly repositories and places that people should visit uh, should have. Um, this idea of collective values of of, of promoting the uh, the values of openness provide some support for people to produce and share and many uh, repositories and sites do this. OER Commons, for example, does this very well. OpenStax does it as well. Um, incentives for engagement are particularly important. We know this from any scenario that we work on OER. Incentives are incredibly important to sustain and to ha always have content and for people to produce uh, content. Uh, quality criteria are important not only for OER but for any content and so 
having clear evaluation criteria and mechanisms has always been a, a, an important thing. So people will look at the repository or the content, uh, uh, expecting it to be high quality and will come back for it and will contribute to it. Uh, focus on openness and OER. We have a lot of hybrid solutions. We have a lot of, of, of repositories and services that are not uniquely open. And so going back to the idea of values, when people, people are more likely, I think, to contribute to something that's very open in principle rather than something that's hybrid that mixes content that's open and is not. Uh, providing uh, uh, mechanisms for auto organization, a community to build, you know, people to, to manage themselves in a community is, is an important feature. Uh, having a clear policy, and this has a connection with everything else we've mentioned before, and making sure that people know what exactly this, this service is, is, uh, is supposed to do and whether it, it really ascribes to principles of openness. Investing in OER development, which we know is incredibly uh, difficult to do, but investing and in not only just providing the service or you know, having a repository to provide this, this, uh, this content, but investing in production is incredibly important. And finally, uh, having some sort of support for teacher professional development uptake. Uh, you can provide the best content possible, but uh, nobody will use it if they don't really know how to, if you don't have uh, opportunities for people to learn how to use it. There are many more. These are just some that have come up in, in recent literature reviews that we've done. And I, I just wanted to put those out there as a way to dialogue beyond the idea of just financial sustainability. So this was meant as a, a brief sort of introduction you know, of spreading out all of these ideas so that we can uh, continue the discussion. Thank you very much again for the opportunity. And I uh, look forward to the continuing conversation. Thank you very much for this excellent presentation. We are now moving to our next speaker, who is Mr. Ahmed Tilly. Warm welcome to you. Mr. Tilly is co-director of the OER lab at the Smart Learning Institute of Beijing Normal University. And he will speak about insight and evolution of OER sustainability models based on, on the result on, of a study. Over to you. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so today we will be talking about a very important topic that has been highlighted by UNESCO in their uh, recommendation in 2019, which is about uh, sustainability models. So actually, our presentation will be a continuity of uh, uh, Dr. Amir, our colleague, has presented, which is about the type of financial models that has been uh, reported. And in this context, we will be talking about insights from both the literature and the experts. So we will start by the basic definition of OER. I think uh, everyone is familiar with, which is uh, OER are learning teaching and the research materials, which has been or which have been published in the uh, public domain under an open license. And here I would like to clarify one misunderstanding of OER, which is is not like free pizza. What do we mean by that? It means like people think that if something is free, they can use it the way they want but actually it's not uh, how OER works. So basically for OER, we need to respect the open license under which an OER is presented. So that's why uh, taking into consideration uh, the open license is very important when we are talking about uh, open educational resources and especially for sustainability models. Uh, what's the challenge of OER? As we all know that OER, like we said, is free, is free of charge. However, for universities or for schools, when they provide OER, they need to pay for too many things, including, for instance, infrastructures, designers, teachers, etc. So the question is, how can they earn money if they need to provide OER for free? So this is like one of the challenges that has been reported with OER. We can like take one, well, one example, which is about John Mitchell. So John Mitchell he is the overseas Stanford universities, and he mentioned due to the sustainability of uh, open courses and OER, uh, Stanford may turn away from offering free online courses. And here we can see the importance of coming up with sustainability solutions and financial solutions, which could help uh, providers to earn money, but at the same time, respect the definition of OER and providing uh, resources for free. So uh, as we all know, uh, UNESCO uh, at the end of 2019 has published the OER recommendations, which focuses on five uh, areas or like five objectives. And one of these objectives is OER sustainability. 
And one of the sub objectives is, as you can see, the first one is about reviewing current provisions, uh, current policies and regulation to expand and simplify the process of creating uh, OER, etc. So this is for the first sub goal, which is related to OER sustainability. So the second one is about catalyzing sustainability models, not only through traditional funding sources, but also through non-traditional uh, sources by mobilizing like different partnership, networking, et cetera. So in this context and in line with uh, UNESCO recommendations and to fulfill at least those two sub uh, goals, we have focused on developing this study. So this study focuses on the use of triangulation method. What do we mean by the triangulation method? The triangulation method means using different sources to collect one specific information about a particular area. And of course, in this study, we will be focusing about sustainability models. So first, in line with UNESCO sustainability, sub goal one, which is about reviewing like uh, sustainability models and policies, et cetera, we have conducted a systematic literature review and we will see we have obtained eight OER sustainability models. Then in order to catalyze uh, sustainability models, what do we mean by this? Means we all know that technology has created new opportunities for different sustainability models. Maybe they were not, uh, they did not exist, let's say 10 years ago or long ago. So in this way, in order to further catalyze OER sustainability models, we have also involved experts and we have used the Delphi method in order to validate the sustainability models. The first uh, process about the systematic review, we have our research questions to answer. So these research questions are mainly in line with UNESCO uh, goals and sub goals about what are the sustainability models that have been uh, presented uh, in the related to OER. And then we will be using different search keywords and databases. Third, we will, we will be using inclusion and exclusion criteria. And at the end, we will talk about paper quality. To search for different sustainability models in the literature, first, we have used different keywords, such as open education, open educational resources, open educational practices, open license, open access. So here we have used different synonyms for open education or OER. And then for models, we have also used different synonyms such as sustainability models, uh, funding models, business model, financial models. So we have combined those terms in order to conduct a systematic and a comprehensive review and identify as much OER sustainability uh, models as possible. And we have used different uh, databases such as Science Direct, Taylor and Francis, IEEE, et cetera. Then, so we have used these keywords and we have obtained a lot of studies. Then to filter these studies, we have used what we call inclusion and exclusion criteria. For instance, we have mainly focused on papers in English. We have uh, focused on papers which gave enough details about OER sustainability models. And one of the things that, <coughs> that we would like, sorry for that, that we would like to point out for it is the exclusion of MOOCs. So as you can see from in the in, uh, exclusion criteria, we have excluded MOOCs. Why you have excluded MOOCs? Because now at least there are a lot of tension in the literature related uh, to MOOCs. Are they OER or not? Are they in line with the definition of OER or not? This is one. Two, for MOOCs, they have different sustainability models, which could be similar or also quite different than OER sustainability models. So in order to stay uh, out of this, uh, type of confusion. So we have excluded any uh, sustainability models which, which have been talking about MOOCs. And at the end, we have obtained, so this systematic review, we have obtained eight OER sustainability models. So the first one is institutional model. The second one is a governmental model, a endowment model, membership model, donation model, freemium model, creator pay model, and sponsorship. So this is for the first uh, part of our study. So we have conducted the systematic review with specific uh, keywords and with specific inclusion and exclusion criteria. And we have identified from uh, the literature these eight uh, models. But like we said, these eight models are not enough. 
Now we will move to the second stage where we will be talking with the experts and to validate it. So in this context, we have uh, chosen carefully uh, experts based on their profile, which should include OER as their research interest, good publication record in this area, and relevant position in active OER uh, organizations. And as, uh, as a result, we have uh, obtained 30 experts who are OER UNESCO chairs in several countries, editors of OER journals, professors and the researchers working on OER in several leading organizations, such as UNESCO, COL, ICD, and Alexo. Actually, some of our colleagues are also here uh, today. For the experts, we asked them first, do you agree or disagree with those eight models that you have identified from the literature? This is one. Two, we have asked them, do you have any other models, maybe which have not uh, mentioned in the literature, but these models could also be efficient in maintaining the sustainability of creating OER. And third, we ask them to rate the maturity of each uh, model. So for instance, we can see like some of the examples that were given by our experts. So uh, for instance, in the previous classification where governmental and institutional models were provided separately, most experts highlighted that many universities are having many governmental funding. So at the end, the government is still responsible on both these models. Therefore, separating them is not an accurate way. So here, our experts suggested that we combine both governmental and institutional models because most of the money coming from institution are basically coming from the government, especially when we are talking about public schools. Then also another example from the inputs given by, uh, by our experts is uh, they suggested that donation and uh, endowment models should be merged together as they have the same goal. So here, as you can see that they have given us uh, several inputs and based on these inputs, we have revised our sustainability models and we have come up with uh, a new taxonomy. At the end, we have obtained 10 OER sustainability models that have been validated by our experts. The first one is through internal funding, means the university covers the cost of creating, delivering, and disseminating OER as part of, of its annual budget in line with its mission mandate. Means that the, uh, the university will be focusing on creating and disseminating OER from their uh, budget. The second model is by participating in OER networks. So here the university pays to be part of a larger consortium that handles the university OER related activities, such as the creation, delivery, and dissemination of OER. And here, uh, one famous example is uh, OERU consortium. The third model is through public funding. So OER are funded through international, national, or uh, local public funding, typically through grants and funded projects. Fourth one is through endowment donations. So here, uh, OER could be supported by providing charities or, uh, or collected through private, private donations or crowdfunding. The fifth one is through sponsor, sponsorship or advertisement. So it means we could, uh, we could give the uh, uh, resources for free, but from time to time, we will promote or advertise for something in return. Sixth, uh, the sixth one is about providing services to learners, means we provide them the resources for free, but at the same time, we can ask them for some services in, uh, and they need to pay for it. For instance, I could give you the learning materials for free as OER, but in return, for instance, if you wanna get your certificate at the end of the course, you need to pay for it. So here we are respecting uh, the definition and the concept of OER, but we provide some paid services. So if you want to uh, use services, you need to pay for them. Also, the, uh, the seventh one is about uh, offering learning related data to companies. So here the cost of OER is addressed by selling data and analytics about learning activities. Uh, so but then we have the by producing OER on demand, means if someone asks for OER, then we will do it for them and they need to pay us. Uh, ninth, by relying on OER authors, means the authors of OER will take the responsibility of creating OER and they will take uh, in, into consideration everything, including their time, like uh, payment and everything. And finally, community-based model. So then the university relies on community 
whose members bear the cost of producing OER as a combination of any of the previous models. So as you can see here, we have obtained 10 different models uh, by the experts. Some of them are already mentioned in our literature review and others are newly mentioned by our experts. And in the next slide, we can see like when we ask them to rate the maturity of these uh, sustainability models. So as you can see here, we ask them, could you please like rate the maturity of each model? And we can see that the first model is through public funding, which is the most common model uh, that has been used or implemented by most universities, which, uh, which is uh, sustainability through public funding. And interestingly, we can see that the last model, which is the least used model, is by offering learning related data to companies. And this is totally understandable because here we are talking about privacy. And despite that this model is used, we can see some examples for each model. So despite that uh, the last model is used, but a lot of experts raised some concerns about like privacy of students. And it's not uh, quite good like to sell like their data or their like learning analytics uh, performance to other companies. So here we can see that uh, the classification of uh, experts have been uh, reported by them. And you can see like from the toppest uh, model to the least model. Uh, and this uh, study has led to uh, a publication. So this publication was in a journal and also we have a full report uh, published on our uh, Smart Learning Institute University. Later on, I could uh, copy paste the link in chat for you in, in case you wanna have it. And thank you so much for uh, for your attention. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for sharing all this relevant information on evolution of OER sustainability models. Uh, last but not least speaker will be Mrs. Tilly Jensen. We are very pleased to have you here. Mrs. Jensen is assistant professor in accounting at, at Athabasca University and expert in digital learning technologies. And she will be talking about higher education perspectives in incentives for the production and use of open educational resources. Mrs. Jensen, you have the floor. Um, thank you very much um, <clears throat> for inviting me to, to speak. And uh, thank you to the other uh, speakers for their very interesting presentations. Um, before we begin, I would like to uh, very briefly uh, provide an introduction to my teaching philosophy and OER background. In the courses I teach, namely accounting, uh, peer-reviewed resources are key to optimizing a student's educational experience. I believe I have an ethical responsibility to remove financial barriers associated with those key learning resources um, based on the mission of Athabasca University. And I personally have the power to do so by creating OER textbooks, which I've done. To date, in the three courses I am responsible for, cost savings of more than $2.8 million have been real realized by using OER textbooks. So it makes me wonder if one person can achieve a $2.8 million cost saving, what can um, all of the, or the majority of faculty members across the globe achieve and enhance accessibility for students? So what I am going to talk briefly about is my experience uh, encouraging the production of OERs and the use of OERs and uh, my belief that we need a paradigm shift. In terms of the production of OERs, uh, a primary barrier based on my experience is finding champions, OER champions at the faculty level. It is um, difficult to obtain workload relief, creating a a comprehensive OER is a mammoth task and um, finding someone who is passionate about teaching and learning in their subject area, someone who believes wholeheartedly in removing financial barriers is, is difficult. Um, at our institution, in our faculty, uh, we are awarded uh, with points. We have to keep a tally sheet um, 
based on our intellectual outputs, namely uh, publishing in high ranking journals and the production of OERs is uh, has only recently been um, valued with um, 30 points. So 40 points for uh, the publishing in a high ranking journal, 30 points for an OER, but it's a one time um, point system. So you're not awarded points, um, uh, many points for updating those OERs. So it's um, there, the incentive needs to be there. Uh, the lesson learned is that um, creating an OER uh, for a, uh, a particular subject um, requires a team of champions uh, rather than just one champion because of the um, workload involved in producing that. Um, by involving people across multiple institutions, um, the uh, adoption rate, I believe, would be enhanced significantly. Um, the buy-in would be there if people are involved. Um, the next barrier is publishers pay authors to write textbooks. I was a an author with um, a publisher in North America, and um, I left that role uh, because I found that um, we were hurting students, hurting accessibility. So I began um, uh, managing the creation of OERs in my, my field. We need executive support for our champions so that they can create those OER resources. We were able to get um, a very large grant from an accounting body in um, the province where I reside. And um, that allowed us to attract champions. Uh, you need to partner with corporate sponsors. We were able to develop a significant partnership with Lyrics Learning Inc, who provides us with um, a digital uh, assessment tool um, and has integrated our OER within that um, uh, digital platform. So it's been very successful. Our student um, reviews are outstanding. Um, and students have asked, actually asked for um, more of these types of, of resources. The lesson learned here is that we need to reward and recognize our champions. This is not done. Um, it may seem trivial, but I believe that this is one of the better ways to inform the uh, university community as well as the public about the importance of OERs. Um, I think it is possible to negotiate uh, a, that a percent of the cost savings realized by adopting UZ, U, OERs go to the authors for research and um, study. Um, I, I think that's important that there be um, financial rewards to incentivize. Uh, this was mentioned by both of the other speakers, uh, credibility of the OER textbook. Um, it is essential that um, these resources are peer reviewed um, and that um, it is integrated throughout the production process of that, that resource. Um, to optimize peer review, um, I think it, be, it needs to be done by a team so that um, it can be advertised that a uh, particular re resource is of a uh, quality nature. So again, a barrier to encouraging the use of OERs is um, finding champions, those individuals who are very passionate about um, the use of OERs and enhancing accessibility for our, our students across the globe. To remove that barrier, again, we need to um, ensure that faculty are rewarded in some way for uh, using OERs. Um, and in 
my particular faculty, um, you there is no reward system um, for the use of OERs. And um, I think by doing that, we would incentivize more faculty members to look at and adopt the use of OERs. It is critical to have um, support from the top at the post-secondary institution. You need a champion at that level as well so that people are encouraged and continually reminded um, that this is part of the institution's mission. Um, the lesson learned, again, you need to celebrate your champions. Who are the individuals using OERs? What is the data of uh, indicating how many are using it, the cost savings? Academic freedom is a barrier. Often my colleagues, when I speak to them about the um, availability and the potential use of OER resources, they tell me it is their right to choose um, what they want and um, nobody has the right to intervene in the choice of their resources. So that is a huge challenge. Um, and the question for me is, should executive require OER when credible peer reviewed resources are actually available? Um, the lesson learned, and this is my personal perspective, please. Um, is this a concern over academic freedom or is it resistance to change or a bit of both? And I, I think it is a resistance to change. It is hard for people to change um, from a publisher provided textbook, um, very costly um, and often not a consideration to faculty it is difficult for them to change to an OER resource. So we need to educate and um, show people the OER availability. Um, credibility of OER textbooks. Uh, I can't emphasize this enough. This is what I continually hear um, from my colleagues is that OER resources are not um, credible. They are not of a quality nature. Um, part of this is being pushed by publishers. Um, publishers have a, a vested interest in ensuring that faculty do not move to OER. It's, uh, it would ultimately be their, their death if all faculty members chose OER. So it is in their interest to discredit OER and um, uh, that's unfortunate. So we need to publish a list of who reviewed OER as well as who has used and uses OER. So transparency is, is key and, and advertising that um, as much as we possibly can. Again, uh, resistance to change, it's related to the academic freedom. Uh, should executive require the use of OER? Um, and I know there are institutions in the United States where the executive has said that part of their mission is to increase the use of OER across the institution. In this year, we will use um, 20% uh, OER next year, we'll try to move to 25%, 30%, et cetera. So what's needed here uh, is a global paradigm shift to legitimize um, OER, and it has to be both top down and bottom up. So in, in summary, the key to produce and use OERs, we need champions at both the faculty and executive level. Those champions have to be incentivized in some way, um, financially with workload reduction. There are uh, different incentives that work for different individuals, as we all know. 
we have found that partnerships are crit critical. Um, for uh, my field, uh, we partnered with um, accounting, professional accounting organizations, as well as uh, corporate sponsors. It is expensive to create um, quality OER resources. And at Athabasca University, as has already been stated by the two previous speakers, uh, part of that, the OER production was funded by the institution, part by the uh, uh, partners. We also need a paradigm shift. We need people to believe in the um, necessity of OERs and um, the value and credibility of OERs. If you have any questions, please contact me. Um, and I would also like to indicate that we're doing a um, research pro project um, on a, a massive open online course in introductory financial accounting. We have um, uh, institutional support on this project. We have um, a, a corporate partner, Lyrics Learning Inc., and uh, the course will be provided free to all students. Um, it's based on international financial reporting standards, so um, should be acceptable globally for those countries who follow international financial reporting standards. And um, we will be reporting the results of this research project within um, uh, one year. But I'm very excited about this. It's opening very soon. And um, I think it's a, a great example of a and uh, potentially successful OER. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mrs. Jensen, for this very inspiring intervention. Thank you to um, all speakers. As we come to the Q&A session of this webinar, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Eleni, who will take care of passing on the many questions we received throughout the presentation. Eleni, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ishatu. Um, so the first question comes from uh, Tarek Ben Youssef, who is asking uh, Professor Tlili uh, that uh, uh, the OER have a cost, and can we talk about OER being available only for high-income countries? I'm, I'm not quite sure what he, what he meant by that, uh, but I would like to say at least like uh, for OER, it's true we give it for free. But the problem is, or the challenge is, we need to pay for the infrastructure, for instance, like the online servers, for instance, the internet, for instance, like uh, also we need to pay for designers to design like the repository or like the learning system or whatever. Also, we need to pay, for instance, for teachers or champions to develop these OER. So basically, yes, we need to pay a lot of money, but at the same time, we still need to give it for free for our learners or users. So this is the big challenge. The challenge is how can we maintain uh, those costs, but we don't ask users or learners to, uh, to pay for us. So that's why we are now thinking about how to develop OER in a very efficient way and sustainable way by keeping uh, or, by, or by respecting the uh, OER definition and concept, but at the same time, we still get the revenue somehow through these models, at least from uh, my perspective, which could be hel helpful to uh, to maintain OER. Thank I'm you, not Professor. Quite sure if if I understand him correctly. Uh, there is a second question regarding uh, incentives and policies, both from Huing Tran Hui and Val Mendes. So, what policies uh, could we suggest to governments to eliminate obstacles and generate scalable OER initiatives? And how can we support local education ecosystems, local content producers to generate OER instead of proprietary education resources? So that that can be answered by all uh, uh, speakers. Uh, if someone wants to take the floor, sure. I I'll mention policies because we, we've done a lot of work with policies at all, all levels of government. And I think uh, the, the, the idea of working top down and bottom up has always been a, a, a mainstream issue for OER work in policy and in, 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 in getting people on board. Uh, I think the, the first issue, which is a, somewhat sort of a common sense and it's part of, of the OER recommendation, is that uh, publicly funded resources need to be 
available to the public. And so the, the issue of openness in this sense, uh, is it's a, it's a battle that's easier to win when we try to convince people uh, on all spectrums of, of economic uh, of the economic spectrum uh, that uh, public resources need to be available to the public. It's it's kind of an easy win. It's not easy to get done, but it's a, it's an easy argument to make. Uh, the other issue, which I think our, our colleague just mentioned in the end, was that we're still uh, quite unbalanced in terms of awareness. I mean, we we we, we a couple of years back, or a little a little bit more, we had this general sense that awareness was not a problem anymore, and people are kind of well aware of what OER is, and we can move on to getting them the conditions to produce and share. But we're still very far from having awareness of what OER is, of course, what copyright is and copyright law. People are very unaware of this. Uh, and all of us, I think, that work with OER know this from day-to-day -day interactions and making more people aware that can become these kinds of champions and participate in this work together, I think, is the, is the bottom-up thing that, that still needs to be done quite often. Thank you. Thank you, Tel. Uh, Professor Jensen, do you have anything to add? Um, I, I agree with my colleague that um, education is uh, of faculty and post-secondary institution executive is key here. Um, and uh, as, as I said, we need a paradigm shift. Um, and, and I hate to use this example, but the pandemic actually legitimized online learning um, because it had to happen. That was the only way for post-secondaries to um, continue. And, and we, we need a, some global event to shift that uh, the paradigm for OER in the same way as the pandemic shifted the paradigm for online learning. So um, uh, I, I don't wish for another pandemic, but we need something to, to demonstrate to people that the necessity, the absolute necessity of, of OER. Thank you. Thank you. So another uh, question for Professor Tritli about his publication. Uh, if uh, he the, the models he discussed have been piloted or field tried in any of the countries. Uh, thank you. Actually, we have started, of course, with the slow steps and small steps. So we have started with our like uh, university context by discussing like the possibilities of having bonuses and getting promoted based on uh, uh, we are uh, publications because as we all know that most of the university systems are based on SSCI and SCI papers. So now we are trying like to talk with them in order to include uh, OER and uh, open uh, access publications as one of the criteria to get promoted. Also for some bonuses, if you create uh, your courses as OER and publish them online. Uh, but also I would like to point out that those systems come up also with some challenges. For instance, if we are talking about like promotion or advertisement, uh, I know some of my colleagues are like from the educational technology background. And now if you are talking about like uh, advertising for something, some of the experts or like some of the pedagogues also mentioned that maybe those advertisement could disturb the learning, the learning process when students are taking an online course, for instance. So here, even the way of implementing those models require us a lot of like uh, careful design and a lot of investigation in, uh, uh, in advance before we start implementing them. So we are definitely, st uh, we definitely start working on a couple of uh, these models. For instance, with Alexo, they have the OER hub, Alexo OER hub, and now we are working with them to create some uh, champions in the Arab region and how they can uh, use uh, OER in 22 Arab countries. So as we said, we started slow and step by step, but definitely a lot of challenges come with those models. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, another question coming from Paul West about license. Uh, there is a risk of license trolls abusing users because of clauses that may be in the legal fine print. Will UNESCO help to analyze and explain the consequences of custom written open licenses? Does anyone have a reply on that? I, I uh... I can take that question if you like. Hello. Yes, please, Zainab. Yes, um, part of the work of the on the OER recommendation looks at licenses. So what we are able to do is to provide links to experts, experts and worldwide who can find 
uh, who can respond to these issues. And also just to say that one of the points of the um, sustainability in the recommendation is about the, um, the faithful translation of OER licenses into different languages, because that's another issue that comes up, not just the fine print, but the uh, lost in translation or mistranslation or issues such as that. So this is an issue that is part of the, of the work being done in the framework of the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Jaina. Uh, would any of the speakers like to react? I'll say something just because I think we've, we've, uh, we've done a really good job in, in championing around uh, Creative Commons licenses as, as part of the, uh, the OER ecosystem. Uh, and I think that that solves a lot of these problems in terms of standardizing licenses. But we also have to recognize that other, uh, other possibilities exist and that uh, Creative Commons licenses don't necessarily address all the needs of every government and every institution. We've had discussions with governments that simply don't want to use that kind of license and they don't see it as appropriate for them. And so I think that we're gonna, we're gonna eventually have to face discussing uh, the appropriateness of these licenses and whether they, in what context do they fit and where they don't and where they don't, we'll have to find other solutions. Thank you. Thank you all for your time on this. Um, we really appreciate it. And uh, all the speakers for the thought provoking presentations. Uh, we will be back in September with uh, a new series of webinars, many, many events to come. And uh, we are looking forward to your participation. Thank you.